Hey guys, all right. Uh, well, I don't actually even know quite what I'm going to say right now. I haven't really, uh, haven't really thought about this too much. Um, and by not too much, I mean at all. <laughs> so today was a um, today was kind of a rough day. Um, so uh, my gym, Pura Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, unfortunately, has become a casualty of the Corona. Um, situation, uh, which is not something that I really anticipated. Uh, so PJ O'Sullivan announced today that he was forced to uh, permanently close a gym that he had been building for, you know, uh, over a decade. Um, and the reason I say I didn't see it coming was because, um, you know, PJ has, you know, he's a teacher as well. And so luckily, you know, bearing the brunt of a of a lease that uh, still has to be paid, I guess, isn't quite as severe on somebody that at least has, you know, some sort of an, an additional income. And uh, so you kind of expected, you know, it would survive. And, you know, there were other gyms kind of in the area that I sort of had maybe suspected might not make it. But it just kind of goes to show you kind of what a, a thin margin or a thin line um, a lot of these gyms operate under, you know. Um, and this one hits hard because, you know, Pura was something that became, you know, kind of a fixture in the BJJ community. Uh, PJ opened it in 2009. And um, it just was kind of a gym that just really grew quickly and drew a lot of talent and there's been so many amazing athletes that have come and gone from there. It just seemed kind of like, you know, I don't want to say invincible because that's cheesy because obviously we're all vulnerable now. It just seemed like a gym that was going to make it, you know. And so we were kind of turning the corner there and PJ decided to to reopen, you know, when we were allowed to, obviously, with the guidelines in place. Um, and unfortunately, uh, a major flood hit. Um, and so the, the sewer drains are, you know, got backed up and, and so sewage was spewing everywhere, uh, ankle deep. And my understanding is that the damages were well over, or at least around the $50,000 mark. And of course, being insurance, they're not going to cover anything because that's what they do best is defer blaming the city. And then, you know, being in a lease with a landlord that, you know, I've never met, but by all accounts is just kind of an asshole. Um, you know, I think the space was problematic from the beginning, but I'm not really here to shit on the guy, but I think, you know, it's up to PJ basically given how their arrangement played out that he would have to pay for it all. Um, and it's just, it's super sad, you know, I still haven't really processed it all. You know, what made PJ so great is, you know, he was a different kind of instructor. He was a different kind of leader in the martial arts community and really a truly rare character. Um, PJ was somebody that would often put his own students and his friendships in front of business. And by that, I mean, he would often make decisions that weren't financially smart, but he would, you know, cut people breaks. And uh, even during the whole lockdown, I mean, he refused to let <laughs> He refused to let any of us pay. Um, I, I wanted to pay, uh, and he, he basically said no to all of us because he didn't feel right charging people without being able to offer a service. Um, and that's pretty rare, um, and that's pretty rare in business, but it's even more rare in sort of the martial arts community. I mean, there's a lot of great people, but most gyms tend to put the business ahead of everything else. And so this strikes me as especially sad because I think, you know, PJ was somebody that really sacrificed his own business because he's a good person, you know, because he didn't want to burden his students. Um, and he was just, you know, I remember meeting him in, in 2009. I came out to the gym. I was training in Niagara and I, I just needed to get out and I needed to go somewhere to, you know, up my game. And I remember the first place that I, you know, I went to some other gyms, but one that I was really excited about 
was pure a BJJ. Um, Ricardo Amendolia told me about it, and I kind of was there almost from the beginning. I probably was there late 2009 when they opened. They were still a, a John Jacques Machado affiliate, and uh, PJ was a brown belt. And uh, I remember meeting him, and I was like pretty intimidated by him because he he seems intense a little bit, but he's just he's just kind of a little, you know, he comes off that way, but he's he's a great guy. And uh, once I got to know him after training there for a bit, I knew that that was the place I wanted to stay. It just had a different atmosphere. You know, I've been to a lot of gyms and I think in the martial arts community, there's often this kind of, there's this kind of false modesty in, in a lot of places I've been to where instructors act like they're humble and genuine, but, you know, push comes to shove. They're, they're kind of bullies in disguise, a lot of these people. Um and, you know, they just want the shine of being the noble warrior, so to speak. But to me, PJ was it was and is the real deal. He's just a very, you know, he wasn't this alpha character that was beating his chest. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't this guy that had to show he was the dominant guy in the room or any of that. I mean, he was just a guy and is a guy that loves, loves jujitsu. Um, and that's, you know, as somebody, I'm a more sensitive guy, more of an emotional guy. And I was just drawn to that, you know, because I don't think great leaders are people that are always, you know, the most brash. I mean, some people can lead kind of with a quiet confidence. And that's what I was drawn to about PJ. And that's, I think, what made the environment special is that it wasn't, you know, it trickles down from the top, you know, and PJ was a very generous person. He was funny. Um, I, I don't mean to refer to him in the past tense because I'm still friends with him and, and he's still still kicking as far as I know. But obviously reflecting back on things, it's it feels like a, it feels like a long time ago, I guess. But um, yeah, and it's just it trickled down and everybody there was was always generous it was it was a, a a good atmosphere there was really good training but there was just a, a good community feel and that's not always the easiest thing to achieve you know a lot of times i've been in rooms that are competitive and that's great but they're not necessarily like a family you know so the only other place i've been to that kind of has that is is sort of parabellum where it's, it's hard nosed training but it's it's got a family feel you know um and so it just was a great environment, a great atmosphere to learn. And I mean, the early days at Pura was just stacked. I mean, we had so many unbelievable competitors come through there. You know, Andre Grandbois came there and started. He was a blue belt when I met him. <laughs> um, you know, we had Drew Ruddle that came through. Uh, we had a guy named Alistair Barr who was unbelievable, has unfortunately kind of left the sport. Um, I'm just thinking out loud of people that came through there that were great. Um, you know, uh, and the, the Nogi crew really stands out. You know, when I first showed up there, it was Rory McDonald was teaching on Thursday nights and Josh Hill was there and Lyndon Whitlock and Gavin and, you know, Scott McCovey and Ozzy Ben, this crazy Australian guy that came down. And, you know, all these pro fighters would show up. You know, uh, Mitch Gagnon was there. I mean, it was crazy. It was, it was, uh, it was the who's who kind of in the in the Canadian MMA scene. And uh, you think back to those days, it feels like a lifetime ago. You know, um, and I remember, you know, we were there for a while, and we were a Machado affiliate. I I remember when PJ got his black belt directly from John Jock Machado. He sat there and handed it to him. So it was always weird to see PJ as a as a you know, a brown belt looking back, but because you always think of these people as black belts, but, you know, so PJ ended up getting his, his, his black belt. And what I've always liked about PJ though, too, is that he's always, he's, he just, he wants to keep moving forward. You know, PJ just loves jujitsu and he doesn't want to just stay stale. You know, he wants to keep moving forward. And I think he made a tough decision to, to leave Machado and go towards, you know, what ultimately was the future of the sport and the Mendez brothers, you know, two just young, unbelievable, new, <laughs> modern style Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners. And I, I remember making that switch <laughs> and I was, you know, I was the heavy guy back then. I was, you know, 
I mean, I've always struggled with my weight. I was, I was probably around 200 pounds and I was a purple belt and not a very good one at that. And I just had this very classic old school game. Everything was heavy passing on the knees. I only really knew how to pressure pass. I only had a few weapons. I'd play a little bit of deep half guard. Um, at, back in that day, I was mostly just trying to survive and I developed this ability to clamp onto people's ankle and half guard and not let go. So I'd, I'd spend a lot of my time on my back trying to figure out how to sweep, but it was really hard to pass my guard because I had these fat legs that I would just hold on your, an <laughs> your ankle. But ultimately that became a weapon that I sort of used down the line. But, you know, I remember playing a bit of rubber guard, but that, that was about it. Didn't have a whole lot else. And, uh, I remember when we became a, a Mendez affiliate and, uh, Man, the game changed. I, I'd never, I'd never spent so much time upside down in my life, and I didn't like it at first. I, I, it wasn't a style that I felt like fit with me, and it didn't make sense to me. Um, but I just, you know, I loved PJ. I loved the crew there, and I, you know, I was just the, the, the level of talent there was so high, and I just was like, well, I'm gonna learn this stuff, you know, and. And down the line, sure enough, I don't really play that style. I'm not a huge De La Hiva guy or an inversion guy, but it just opened my mind to the possibilities of, of jiu-jitsu, and it made me more fit, and it made me more of an intelligent grappler, I think. There's always that benefit of learning a style that you don't necessarily end up playing. I don't think it's a waste. I think, in fact, it's great to learn, you know? I mean, if anything, it's helpful to defend and... And like I said, it just opened my eyes to so many things. And it's hard looking back because I was such a different person when I went to, to Pura. I mean, the, 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 the sort of transformation, you know, to, to, the thought of me actually ever being able to win, you know, Nogi Provincials or the Ontario Open at the brown and black belt level and then to ultimately a silver medal at the world. I mean, it was just, it was people would laugh at you if you if you suggested that I would have laughed at you I would have been like you're fucking crazy there's no way you know and it's just I think back to those days and it's hard it makes me really sad because uh you know I've just changed so much because of that gym in, in a positive way I learned so many hard lessons in that gym um so so many I mean I would leave <laughs> I, I remember leaving those those days after those hard practices whether it was gi or no gi and I would just drive home. I was living in St. Catharines at the time. So it was like about a 45 minute, probably about an hour or more each way with traffic because I'd drive up the Red Hill. And, uh, you know, and it was just, I'd, I'd sit there driving quietly home because I was just, it was so hard. I was just like, it was so physically demanding. And I was just like, man, I'm really bad at this, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of been my, I've, I've never gotten away from that. I still feel that way, but... It was especially bad back then, but I went from this kind of overweight guy that, you know, I was training maybe a couple times a week. I had no idea. I had no idea what it took to get better at jujitsu. You know, I started at this small gym and got promoted to purple belt way too fast, you know, and, uh, I just remember like I was kind of, I felt like a bit of an outsider because I came from another gym and I had this purple belt and, uh, it was so funny because the guy that promoted me, it wasn't even like a real belt. Like it didn't even have like the, the, the pad or the, the little bar for the stripes. I remember wrapping it. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to be like, Oh, I want to get stripes here. I want to pr get promoted here. And I think I, I think I ended up taking hockey tape <laughs> and wrapping it around the belt so that I could have stripes eventually on it. It was the dumbest fucking thing. So I eventually bought a coral belt, I believe online, a purple belt that was like a real belt and it actually fit because the belt that I got when I was promoted, I was thinner and then I got pretty heavy and it, <laughs> it, it, uh, it didn't fit very well when I was at Pura. So I remember, I remember buying a coral belt and eventually it turned pink. And so it became kind of a thing there. Um, but I remember trying to become more of a part of the gym, you know, cause I was still sort of cross training in Niagara, but you know, PJ was always great to me. You know, I said I wanted to grade under him and he started to allow me to be part of that. And I still remember getting those first stripes on my belt. And I felt like I was in that gym. I felt like I'm really doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now. Like I'm really training. I'm, I'm actually like in a really legitimate gym. And, uh, 
so many people, you know, have gone on to open their own gyms from there, especially that original crew. Um, and it's just, it's been such a crazy ride um, to think that I got to the other side here in 2019 and I eventually got Actually, there's a there was a funny story. I ended up leaving for a couple of years. I remember I was a four stripe purple belt for a while, and uh, I ended up leaving. I was I, I ended up getting a job in Mississauga, and I had a I I remember I tore my MCL because I was training with Rory and Lyndon and those guys, and it wasn't anything they did. I just popped it trying to knee cut, and uh, it just got worse and worse, and I it didn't heal for probably like a good six seven months. It was really wobbly, and I just couldn't train. And I had a job, and I ended up leaving and it became one of the worst periods in my life. I got super depressed and suicidal and the whole bit. It was awful. It was just a nightmare. And I remember I didn't have jujitsu in my life then. I wasn't part of the gym then. And, uh, and it's not, I guess looking back, it's kind of, it's not a coincidence that I probably had one of the worst periods in my life when I wasn't there. Um, it was really bad. It was really bad. And, uh, it was really hard to go back. You know, I remember, I remember, being like, you know, it was so hard because I was just, I was out of shape and I felt disconnected and I just forced myself to go one night and went back and just totally fell in love with it again. But the funny thing was, is that just before I left, PJ was about to promote me to brown belt, like literally the day of or day. And he kept walking around. He had bought the belt and he kept saying, have you seen PFED? Like he's, I I have this belt. I'm going to promote him. So I was gone for probably two and a half years, maybe three. And, uh, it was one of the longest, worst periods of my life. And I remember, I remember finally getting back there and I I was training again and I had this, the faded, super faded (laughs) purple belt and I was training with a blue belt at the time and he tapped me out a couple times. I was so out of shape. I was terrible. Uh, trying to come back from a three-year layoff with literally no jujitsu, not thinking about it at all. And the guy looked at my belt. He's like, oh, you might get promoted soon. He said, you might finally get your blue belt. (laughs) And I said, no, 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 I'm I'm a purple belt. And he looked very shocked by that, Um, as he should have been. I mean, I was three years off and out of shape, so I wasn't very good. But but that was probably in 2016, I guess, I, I went back. And it's just crazy to think, like, you know, PJ just accepted me right back in. And I think it was about six months i remember a couple of aoj guys were down danny and ian and uh that was kind of my reintroduction to jujitsu and uh eventually one day i was there and pj six months later i think finally promoted me to brown belt and he put it around my waist i'd lost a lot of weight at that point i was like probably lost 50 pounds so he had this giant brown belt that was way too big (laughs) it was like an a4 a3 or something um, so I've, I've had this problem of never quite getting a bet belt that fits, you know, or at least I had that problem. So I ended up buying a different one eventually, but it's just crazy to think from 2016, you know, we kept training and I just kept improving. And the thing that changed for me is that I started to learn a different style of jujitsu. I really started to get into leg locks and more modern stuff. And the thing I've always loved about PJ is he never... You know, he never he never told me that what I was doing was stupid. He never held me back. He never judged me for wanting to try, you know, knee bars, toe holds, heel hooks, all this kind of stuff, you know. And a lot of people, even within that gym, I don't want to name names, but there are people in that gym, prominent figures that uh, have talked a lot of shit about me doing that. And uh, PJ was not one of them, and he never was. And it's because of that that I, I was able to find you know, my path that ultimately helped me become the grappler that I was able to get to in 2019, you know, and it was cool. Like PJ was always the kind of guy that would, I'd be learning new stuff and that he didn't know. And he wasn't, he was never intimidated by that. Like he never, he never was like, oh, I don't know that. So, uh, you know, you're not, you're not going to do that. In fact, he would ask me to teach stuff. Like he would ask me to show him ankle lock setups and all this stuff. And and it's still to this day he does. And I just, I don't know a lot of instructors like that. I haven't met a lot of instructors like that. That's where I talk about this ego piece where 
a lot of these instructors act gracious, but it's until you start using stuff that they don't know that you start to see them kind of be like, well, you know, they're not so cool about it. But not PJ. He was always super supportive of it. Almost surprised, like shockingly so. I was always really admired that about PJ. Um, and so ultimately I started to develop this game. And the other thing that was really cool is that, you know, I started to branch out and, and because Rory was part of the sort of Pura family. He eventually left to open Parabellum. And again, PJ had no problem with me going to cross train at Parabellum. And I really credit both gyms in, in helping me develop because they both offered such a different product. You know, like what Rory was doing was very different from what most gi gyms are doing. And, and again, PJ was never intimidated by that. I'd always ask him, like, look, you know, if, if you have a problem with this, uh, uh, you know, if you want me to choose and I'm then I'm choosing Pura, you know, like I've said that to him even to this day. And he never, he never forced me to choose, you know, I always tried to be, you know, diplomatic. I always wanted to represent both gyms in competition, but he never forced me to choose, you know, and I've, I, again, that's just something that's pretty rare, I think, especially in the jujitsu world, you know, you're often looked at as a traitor for wanting to, um, for wanting to, to train somewhere else as well. Um, but it was, it was, uh, you know, and it's just funny to think that end up getting to the worlds and doing well and earning a silver and coming back in December and PJ put the black belt on me, promoted me to black belt. And it was the first time a belt had ever fit me properly. <laughs> and the other thing is like, he bought me this great belt, you know, he bought me this really high end show you roll belt and you know, he didn't cut corners, he didn't, ha you know, he could have easily, you know, um, and I, I just really respect that about him, and I've always appreciated that, it's always meant a lot to me, um, and it's just, it's just hard looking back, you know, it's hard to look back now and think that, you know, it's already been almost eight months since, I guess he, I think he promoted me on December 19th, it's already been like eight months, and you just think, Everything seemed so good, you know, everything was in a great place, it seemed like the gym was doing well, and it's just amazing how things can turn on a dime, and uh, um, life's crazy, um, but so many great memories there, so many great people that I've met, I mean, there's so many teammates that I just, I love, and I don't want to stop training with, you know. I think about uh, people like Corey Greenlaw and, you know, all the Nogi guys that I train with on Saturdays, the Sheehan brothers, uh, you know, Lyndon, uh, <clears throat> Lyndon Clark's a great training partner, Aiden, Steve Esty, I mean, you know, PJ, Greg Young, <laughs> Richard, Brad, um, there's just so many people. I mean, it's just such a great crew of people. I mean, it's it's almost impossible for me to list all the people that I've enjoyed training with. And I'm just really having a hard time processing it right now. It sort of hit me, and I don't really want to believe it, but that's, I guess, where we are. Um, but one of the best gyms I'd ever trained at, and uh, it really hurts to see it, to see it go under. Um... I don't really know what more to say. It's just been kind of hard for me. I just wanted to get some thoughts out and reflect on my time there, which is kind of the abbreviated version, but nobody's going to want to listen to me go on for hours about this, <laughs> as I have a tendency to do, as you may have noticed. I just want to say thank you to PJ. Um, he's just made a lot of sacrifices to make it work there. I know it hasn't been easy. It's a guy that juggles a full-time job. This is a guy that's had multiple knee surgeries. He's had multiple injuries. Um, you know, but he's never he's never made it about himself. He's always been there no matter what. And he just shoulders the burden himself, which I've always kind of wished he didn't, you know. I was PJ's not the kind of guy that's really particularly open with talking about how he feels and asking for help and I just hope he knows that we all love him, and uh, he has so much support behind him if he ever wants to venture down the uh, jiu-jitsu road again, which I hope you know, could be a possibility in the future, but 
it just doesn't make any sense right now. You know, we live in this ridiculous time where we talk about essential services being McDonald's and Tim Hortons, you know, but for a lot of people like me, jujitsu has been essential. And I don't, I don't say that lightly. Like, you know, I don't, I don't say that to be ironic or something. I mean, it's true. I just think, you know, I've put on a lot of weight. My mental health has been terrible. Um, a lot of really, really low moments over the last six months. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's much of an end in sight. Um, it just frustrates me that, you know, I'm not, I'm no conspiracy theorist. I understand this thing's dangerous. It's just, it's really frustrating when you have a government that says it's too dangerous to do jujitsu, even with, a, you know, within a bubble that you could do, you know, I could legally do jujitsu in my house with people in my bubble, but I can't go to the gym <laughs> and do that. You know, you can go fly in a plane. I can catch a flight to Miami tomorrow. Um, I can go to a restaurant and sit and talk with no mask on with people all over the place and kids can go back to school and you can protest in the streets in tens of thousands of people. No problem, but you can't, you can't do jujitsu. <laughs> you can't, <laughs> you can do it in a square socially distance with a partner um, the, the piece that just really bothers me is sort of the hypocrisy of, of the, the policies. As my friend Eric Nice said, it via the, these, these policies violate their own logic. I can go to a gym and huff and puff and sweat and I can do yoga, but I can't do jujitsu with a 10 person bubble. We're living in, in crazy times and, uh, I just hope everybody stays safe. I hope everybody stays healthy. Um, I'm just grateful for all the years I had at the gym. And uh, I don't know where I go from here, to be honest with you, in terms of training. I don't know what's next for me. I don't know what's next for any of my training partners, my friends. It's just really sad today. And, uh, you know, hopefully something good will come out of this in the future, but it just doesn't feel that way right now. So for anybody listening, thank you guys for all the... Uh, tough rounds. Thank you for all the lessons. I've become a much more resilient person. I feel like 2019 was a year that just didn't seem possible for someone like me, especially when I first started jujitsu. And uh, it will be one of the biggest highlights of my life, no doubt. And I was so proud to represent uh, PJ and Pura. Of course, also Rory and Parabellum, but... um, it was such an honor to to get to black belt under PJ. Um, and it's funny, I feel like I had such a great high before all this hit. And I, sh- you know, I look back and I'm angry as hell. I'm really pissed off and super sad. But I have a lot to be grateful for. And I'm trying to think about that. You know, I had a great run in 2019 in competition. I hit some really high highs and then I got promoted to black belt. So it was a... Uh, I guess if if there was going to be a long shutdown, I guess it's a good way to go out. But it still doesn't. It still feels like it's something I would trade in to be able to have things back to normal again, and to have PJ have a a functioning gym and everybody to be able to train again. So, anyways, I think I'm rambling at this point. But ten years is just a long time to spend in one spot. Eleven years and. Uh, I'm just grateful for everything that Jim did for me. Um, I'm grateful especially to PJ, and uh, hopefully there will be better days ahead. So thank you guys for listening to this. I hope hope it was somewhat interesting or whatever, but I hope your gyms are surviving. I hope you guys are staying safe and able to train in some way, and uh, I will see you at some point in the future.